My name is David, and today we're going to be continuing through the book of Romans, uh, picking up kind of where we left things off last week, chapter 7, um, looking at the issue of identity, which I think is a very sort of buzzy word, right? It's like identity is one of these words that's talked about a lot right now. So we're just going to look at what God says about it. And to begin to, to really get into this thing, I want to invite you to invite Jesus to speak to you about, about some of this. And to do that, it's important, particularly as we're talking about identity, it's important to remember that God is not going to speak hopelessness, worthlessness to you. He says that. That's not, he's not going to speak shame. He may call out guilt. He may say hard things, but the goal, his goal is freedom. The enemy may accuse, may come in and try to plant things that sound spiritual that are destructive, but hopelessness, worthlessness does not come from God. He has come to give you life, not to speak worthlessness, not to speak shame. And that's important when we're inviting him to speak to us, that we have that foundational understanding because the enemy does try to sow lies. He tells us that. You need to be aware that that there's an enemy who will try to deceive you. So with all that said, ask him to help you see, reflect on these questions with me. Who are you at your core? Who are you made to be, the true you? How close do you feel to that person? How close do you feel to being who you're supposed to be? Where do you feel not yourself? When I was addicted to pornography, living in some different things, right? I felt not myself. Nowadays, if I slip, I lose my temper with my kids, or something, right? I feel not myself. It feels dissonant with who I am. Where do you feel that? Where do you feel that dissonance with your design? Where did you feel it this week? And what do you do with it? Last week, we looked at Romans chapter 7. And we're going to go back starting in verse 21. Because God tells us he gave us the law to show us the dissonance. To show us where we live out of alignment with what's true. Not to shame us, but to free us. You have to know there's a problem to be able to deal with it. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 21 He says, I find a law like gravity, right? That evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, in my body. And it's at war with the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin that is in my members, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Because what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, God condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, because those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. 
But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal, the fleshly mind is enmity, hostility, rebellion against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be subject to the law of God. So then, those who are in the flesh can't please God, but you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Today we're going to be taking things in some bigger chunks. We're going to be having these sort of broader portraits. Paul, the way he writes this chapter, the way he wrote this chapter has this He's attacking the same issue from a few different angles. So we're going to keep seeing these chunks, and they're going to make the whole thing make more sense as we go. But the crux of that first section and the first point today is that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There's a really big assumption in that statement, right? That you are in Christ. If you're here today and you have not looked to Jesus to receive his transformation and his forgiveness, he says your condemnation is still on you. Your guilt is still on you. You still stand condemned or guilty. Jesus told us in John three seventeen, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The one who believes in Jesus is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is already condemned. Because he's not believed in the name. And name in this culture, in Hebrew culture, is not just the spelling, but it has to do with the identity, the personality, the who he is. Condemned because if not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. And people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest their deeds should be exposed. But the one who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 explains that as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Now, as we've looked at in other parts of Romans that we've been going through, none of us is clean, is the point. We all have a, a broken nature, a corrupt nature where we desire wicked things if we're just left to our own devices. And so that needs to be restored. And Jesus wants you to receive the new nature, the new life that he has purchased for you. He wants you to receive the pardon that he bought at the cross. But if you don't, then he says the condemnation remains on you. You're still a slave to your appetites, still ruled by selfishness. And so while you're there, the condemnation remains. But the goal, his desire, is that you would come to him, let the light expose what needs to be corrected, and and receive his life and his transformation and his forgiveness. Be born again, born new, born spiritually. And this is very different from just going to church. You can go to church and not be born of the Spirit. This is about relationship with Jesus. Receiving his transformation. And he says your mindset is a good indicator of where you're at with that. So this is a good place for us to take stock for a second. Let him speak to you. What is your mindset on? What's at the center of your thoughts? What's your heart go after? 
if you realize that your mind has been set on the things of the flesh, he talks about, you know, sexual immorality, greed, the, the things, that, if, if your heart has been set on selfishness and not set on the spirit, it's not been set on knowing God, then he says, you need to turn to him. The point, again, the point is not shame. The point is not to speak worthlessness. The point is to call you to receive life. He wants you to be transformed so much that he died for it to be possible. He suffered the weight of your sin for it to be accessible to you. And so I'm not going to take a lot longer for that right now, but I want to tell you that if you're realizing that today, you can right now in your chair, there's no special thing you got to do. You don't have to put oil on your head or anything. Like you can just ask him to change you and he'll change you. You can ask him for that life and he'll give it to you. If you have questions, you can come and talk with us afterwards. You can email us. But he wants you to receive the life. Now, I want to be clear here, too. He's not calling us to endless self-analysis. The point of everything that he's telling us here, right, back in Romans 8, is that there is now no condemnation for the one who is in Christ. Once you have turned to him and asked him to transform you, he says, condemnation is paid. The, the guilty verdict is no longer on you. And he needs to remind us because we forget, we struggle with it. Because even after you have set your mind on Jesus and said, I want to grow in relationship with you. I want to know you. I believe in your name. I believe you are who you say you are. We still screw up. Right? And he, some people take this passage and, and interpret it as this, this victory through Jesus means that, we're no longer, that we no longer fail, that there's a capacity right now for us to no longer fail. But I think on top of the fact that the text doesn't say that, it's also very clear that none of us actually do it, right? Nobody actually lives a flawless life. We can grow, and we're going to look more at what it means to grow in the fruits of the Spirit, but we all screw up. We're going, you are going to make a mistake. You're going to fail. And he knows that. He tells us in 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, when you screw up, you take it to him. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the payment, the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world, for all who look to him. And yeah, we're going to look more at that. Again, we're going to look more in a little bit at this idea of knowing that he's our payment does call us out of sin. But I want to just make sure we don't miss this, that what he's saying, that you're going to stumble and you don't need to be on eggshells with him. Your father wants you to know you don't have to freak out about making mistakes. That he's still your father. There's no more condemnation. There's no more guilty verdict. When you stumble, even into big failures... He says, if you've looked to him, your identity is in him. The failure does not define you anymore. My mom is, uh, teaches the women's study and has talked often about not long after she met Jesus and was transformed, delivered from the demons that lived in her, she stumbled into some like huge sexual sin that had really big implications for the church that she was a part of. It's like, it's not like I said a bad word. It's like, had a, these were like big issues. But it's, it's no longer guilty. It's not, or no longer cut off from God. It didn't, that didn't change her status as God's child. It has consequences. But we're still in the family. We've been made new. And he explains this in verse 10. He says, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Because as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, here, there's, this is going to be the first of a few places where we're, I'm going to begin by telling you what he's not saying. There's, there gets to be a lot of confusion, particularly in this passage, um, about some of these ideas of like the body, the flesh. When he talks about the body, he's not talking about just your natural body. There's more going on here. He's speaking of the old nature, the corrupt slavery to your appetites. That's what, and it's important to understand this because it has been misunderstood often. It's been misapplied as though God is saying our bodies are bad or nature is bad. That food or sex or laughter, that these things are bad. But that's the opposite of what he's actually getting at. He's saying he's going to give it life. Jesus didn't come to destroy creation. He came to restore creation, to set it free. He explains in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, um, Paul was writing to, to Timothy, giving warnings about how to, how to, what to guard against in the church. And he said there would be false teachers, that there are deceptive spirits at work through false teachers that forbid marriage and command to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So he warns us that the enemy wants to take the, the truth of the danger of things like drunkenness or promiscuity, the destructiveness of those things, and he'll push us to extremes to, to pervert what is true. It is true that, right, sex outside of marriage abuse of alcohol, abuse of food, all sorts of things. Those are destructive. Those are sinful. But it's also sinful to despise God's good intentions for sex and alcohol and food. He says he's given those things to us as gifts, not to be despised. It is sinful to despise, to pervert the truth about what God's given us. And this may sound like a tangent, but it's really not because what he's saying here, the point of contrasting the body with the spirit is not to say be unphysical, immaterial, spiritual in the sense of disconnected from, your, from the body, from the real world. And it is often understood that way. We often get, it's easy to get confused about this, that it's thinking of a monastic existence or, you know, transcendent spirituality that has nothing to do with real life. That's not what he calls us to. He says to be in the world, not of it, new identity, but in it. He's working to give life to the mortal body. You have a new nature. And knowing that identity, knowing this, this intention of his to restore everything, changes the way that we walk through life. He says... You know, you don't owe the old nature anything. You don't, you, you're no longer the corrupt, broken, old person. So don't give it anything. Don't feed your greed or your shame, you know, self-loathing. Don't feed your, your indulgence, your lust. Don't feed those things because that's not who you are anymore. You're not your temptations. You're not defined by those things anymore. Your choices still have consequences. But that's not you anymore. He says, instead, you have received the spirit of God. And so to be spiritual means to live in line with the Holy Spirit, to walk with the Holy Spirit. Second point today is to walk in the spirit. And again, there's misconceptions around this. We think of it sometimes, it gets often approached as walk in prophecy in tongues. 
or evangelism or depend on, on God for all your financial needs in the way that you don't work a job or something. It becomes spiritualized. And that's not what he is saying when he says to walk in the spirit. For some people, it, he calls us to, to live by faith in unique ways with our finances. Some are gifted in prophecy and tongues and evangelism. But he warns us that you can speak in tongues and go to hell. You can prophesy and not know him. Again, walking in the spirit means walking with Jesus. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 tells us that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Romans chapter 12, five through eight, tells us that we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. And having then gifts of the Spirit that differ according to the grace that he has given to us, use the gift he's given you. If he's given you prophecy, then prophesy in proportion to your faith. If it's ministry, minister. If it's teaching, teach. If it's exhortation, exhort. If it's giving, give generously. If it's leading, lead diligently. If it's showing mercy, show mercy with cheerfulness. Ephesians 5, he says, because you were once darkness, but now you are children of light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out, discovering, learning with him what is pleasing to the Lord, what's acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Instead, expose them. Now, this is, to some degree, a checklist. It's got that, that air about it. Of this, this is something you can run down to see how your walk with Jesus is going. But it's more than that. This is given to us more as a portrait. It's not that you would just run down a checklist, but that you would talk with him about it. That you would be, these things give you an idea of what your walk with Jesus should look like to point you to the man himself beyond just the pages or the principles, the living, risen Jesus. Personally, the way this works out for me, I seek to grow in the fruits and the gifts of the Spirit. I seek to grow in prophecy. I seek to grow in tongues and evangelism, administration, the different gifts that he, he says, look for what will build up the body and seek to grow in that. Intentionally work on that, right? I intentionally work on the fruits of the Spirit. If, I'm, if I realize I'm impatient, then I need to work on that. If I realize I am lacking in faithfulness, I'm not, you know, people can't count on me. Or if I'm lacking in joy or in love, then I work on that in my own ability, but I do that critically. That happens with Jesus. If you try it without him, it doesn't work. You can't get there. He told us you have to abide in him and you'll bear the fruit. You spend time with him. Read the Bible. He says, pray without ceasing. Continually be talking with him about what's going on in your life. Engaging in the relationship with him. Walking with him by the spirit, by his spirit in you. Letting him direct you. Doing the things he calls you to do. Now, this is mysterious, right? It's, we're talking about personal relationship with the eternal triune God in whom we live and move and have our being, who is beyond time and space and within time and space. It's mysterious, right? And so he helps us some more here. If we go on verse 16, he says, the spirit 
himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him. And he's not saying go trying to get persecuted, but holding on tight regardless of the fact that persecution is inevitable if you hold on to him. If we suffer him with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of creation, the universe, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope, because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of God's children. We know that all creation right now is groaning and laboring with birth pangs. hurricanes and famines and it's aching with pain for the day of new birth and not only the universe but we who have the first fruits of the spirit grown within ourselves eagerly waiting for the adoption for the redemption of this body when the corruption puts on incorruptible we were saved in this hope that but hope that is not the seen is not hope Or why would you hope for what you have, right? We hope for what we do not see. We eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And likewise, the Spirit helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession with us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the, the chosen ones, for the church, for the saints, according to the will of God. So we know that everything works together for good for those who love God, those who are the called according to his purpose. We've come back to this passage a ton lately. We've been looking at Romans 8 very often because... I think Jesus really wants us to be aware of what the promise is. He wants us to be looking forward to his return. And so we've been talking a lot about this idea that he's put the ache inside of us. He tells us he's set eternity in our hearts to reach for him. That the hopes that we have that right now are unsatisfied often have a place of fulfillment. The unveiling. The, the restoration, the new birth of the universe when he is not, again, it's not disembodied. It's not ethereal. It's not little golden harps floating on clouds. Real tangible universe that we will enjoy with him. But here, today, I want to zero in on something from here that we haven't looked at as much. He tells us that perfect relationship with him It's a big part of what we look forward to. Perfect relationship with Jesus is coming. Right? This corruption will put on incorruption. The redemption of the body is not yet. And I think that is so hopeful and freeing because I expect of myself often, right? And I'm sure you find the same thing that that I would be perfect today. I wouldn't voice it, but I have the expectation of myself. And he's, it's so freeing to see that he expects us to need his help, to not know even what help we need. He says, you don't even know what to pray for. So the Spirit's praying with you, groaning within you. And the Father has put it on his heart Jesus is praying for you, your advocate before the throne. It says, so we know that everything is working together for your good. Father, Son, and Spirit are working together for your good. Everything you suffer is working together for your good. Every mistake you make, he will work together for your good. 1 Corinthians 13, 
Verse 11 says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Right now we see in a mirror, dimly, then face to face. Right now I know in part. Then I will know as I am known. First John 3, he tells us, beloved, we're God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when Jesus appears, we will be made like him because we will see him as he is. We will know him as we are known by him. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. He says, right now, we're his children, and he expects us to be his children. Doesn't expect you to be full grown yet. So much weight off our shoulders there. I don't expect my six-year-old to be 20, right? I mean, he's six. There's things I can expect of him. There's things I train him into. I'm working with him, but he's six. I'm not asking him to run to the grocery store for me, right? And even to ask him to like clean his room is like, it's work. It's, it, it takes a lot for him right now to discipline those little six-year-old desires, and I know that he's six, and I don't despise his six-year-oldness. I love his six-year-oldness. I love the stage of life that he's in. While I look forward to his adulthood, I look forward to, right, one, there's going to be a day where he'll be an adult. We can be friends. But right now he's six. There's going to be a day when you will know Jesus as you are known. But not right now. Right now, you're still a kid. We are still children, and it has not yet appeared. The thing that we ache for, the hope that we were saved in, has not yet appeared. And there's so much release in that. We shouldn't try to fall back into being infants, right? When my six-year-old tries to act like he's a baby, then I have to, like, call him out of that, right? Maybe he gets a timeout or whatever. There's, there's consequences, but he's still my kid and I don't despise his need and your father doesn't despise your need. I, recently, Jesus moved me to, to read through the, the gospels again, to just try to read through them on their own real, you know, faster to get the, get the sense of the story. And it struck me the, the, the thing of process like consider for 30 years, Jesus just did carpentry. You know, it seems like that's pretty much it. He began his ministry at 30. So prior to that, he had not been doing any noticeable ministry. He was just growing. And that was intentional. God did that. He needed to experience everything we experienced. There was, God was working through that. But I mean, I don't know if I would have had the patience for that, right? Like, Shaving this chair, one wood shaving at a time, knowing that you're there to save the world. That takes patience. God's comfortable with process. He's okay with it taking time. And this is also tremendously hopeful, hope-giving, because there's an end in sight. He says, it's not going to be like this forever. I'm so glad I'm not 11 years old anymore. I mean, like, right, isn't it nice to be out of the, the insecurity and strangeness of like 11, 12, 13? I'm glad to not be there anymore. Right now, spiritually, most of us are kind of there. We're not babies. We know some stuff, but we're not grownups either. We are not yet in the settledness of adulthood. We're not all we're designed to be. And so it's good news that it's coming. You're not stuck in spiritual puberty for eternity. There's a redemption coming. The fullness of all this that we ache for right now. The universe will be set right and you will be set right. 
You're not going to struggle with insecurity. No more deceptions. No more failures. No more temptations. Our relationships with one another, we will be relating to one another without any corruption. All the good and none of the bad. Again, that's why it's important, I think, for us to understand that it's not immaterial. It's more real. And so right now we're just in the process, moving toward that. And here in Romans, he explains that his presence in us now is actually the first sign of the new creation. That you are today a new creation. His kingdom has begun invading the, what the enemy has sought to steal through your life. He's begun it in you. He's restoring you. And creation sees that and is excited because it sees the new birth that's coming. But it's begun in you already. As the band is coming back up, I want to invite you guys to think about how this applies in your life. Ask him, where, where is he calling you to embrace the true identity? That you are now light in the Lord. And again, one of the, the last misconception, last one of those things to untie. You know, we think of eternal life as afterlife, right? When we hear this, Jesus came to give eternal life, we think that starts when I'm dead. But eternal does not mean later. It means unending. It means it's already begun. If you've trusted in Jesus and received his spirit, you are now living in the eternal life. It has begun. You're now his child. You're now freed from the, the mastery of the body. The body is no longer in charge. Your appetites, your desires are no longer your God. God is your God. Now your body, your desires, all those things that are a part of you are still a part of you, but now they serve him and they serve you as you serve him. And everyone who hopes him, he says, thus purifies himself. So you begin walking it out. So how is he calling you to walk it out? Is there condemnation, lies that you have believed that you need to release? Are there places where you've been feeding the old nature that you need to crucify the flesh. The places he's calling you to walk in the mission, to do the work that he's called you to, stirring up the gifts that he's given you to apply the gifts, to grow in the fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, prophecy, evangelism, administration, teaching, You just need to meditate more on his promise that he's coming back, that this is good, that this is all going to be worked out in eternity. In the, in, in the rest of your life, you're going to see this fulfilled. In the land of the living, you're going to see this fulfilled. Every hope, every desire satisfied. You just need to meditate on that more. Have mercy.